Awesome. Um, welcome everybody um, to the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience uh, panel on Rosenwald School alumni and communities. Uh, my name is Lizzie Meister. I'm the public programs manager here at the museum and I'm thrilled to welcome you all in person and online um, to participate in this fascinating conversation with our three panelists today who are keepers of the Rosenwald School histories and communities. Um, so I'll introduce the three of the folks here in a second, um, but this event is part of our ongoing series centered around our current special exhibition, A Better Life for Their Children, Julius Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington, and the, 9, 000, the 4, schools that changed America. Um, we're grateful, the museum is grateful to Bill and Susan Hess, the Kahn Family Foundation, um, for their support of this special exhibition with the Louisiana Endowment for the Humanities as a media partner. Following this conversation for our folks in person, there'll be a small reception in the museum store. Um, uh, we have predetermined uh, questions that the panelists can answer. Um, and so as we go through today, you'll see our flow um, where folks may choose to answer a question, may choose to skip a question, um, and um, still have the opportunity to respond to one another. So what's this panel about? This panel is an opportunity to hear from folks who are deep in continuing the story of their Rosenwald School history. Um, the three folks we have here today are dedicated community historians um, and ensuring that the legacy of their Rosenwald schools don't go forgotten. So with that, I'd like to introduce our three panelists. This gentleman to my um, immediate right is Mr. Frank Taylor. He's from Monroe, Louisiana. Um, he went to Carroll High School in Monroe, and he went to ULM, and he's been working in the community um, since 1967, working to coach kids um, and organizing community events, um, including Mother's and Father's Day programs. And uh, as you'll soon see, he is a community historian and telling the story of the Monroe community, the Mount Nebo community. Um, he got involved with the Rosenwald Project because it's it's his neighborhood. and. Um, dedicated to the community work of keeping those stories alive. To my, oh no. I lost a sheet, but that is okay. I, oh, it's under the computer. <laughs> what, of, what to of my introduction? In the middle um, is Dr. Rose Cooks. Dr. Cooks is from De Quincey, Louisiana, where she attended uh, Rosenwald School um, in 1944. And high school, she completed here in New Orleans at Walter L. Cohen uh, High School uh, in 1956. She holds a BA in English with social, social studies minor in secondary education, which was completed at Southern University. She earned an MA plus 30 degree in education technology and administration and supervision at Wisconsin State University in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and at McNeese State University in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Dr. Cooks has taught English, history, and social studies to middle school and high school students, teaching in parish schools, Catholic schools, and private schools. Dr. Cooks is currently the principal uh, at Eternity Christian Academy Learning and Training Institute, um, which is currently being rebuilt in West Lake, Louisiana. Dr. Cooks um, serves as the co-pastor at Attorney Full Gospel Fellowship Church. She is the five-fold ministry teacher of ministers who are studying and training to serve in the kingdom of God. And finally, the uh, far, far right of our panel is Mr. D Donald Victorian. Donald Victorian is retired from a career as petroleum chemist, um, and he retired after 35 years. He also served in the U.S. Army, where he had a career, 15 years as an infantry officer, um, where he spent three years of active service during Vietnam and 12 years in the Louisiana Army National Guard and Army Reserves. Mr. Victorian attended elementary and um, elementary school and went to Grand Avenue High School in De Quincey, Louisiana and graduated in 1966. Following high school, he attended USL in Lafayette, Louisiana and completed a degree um, with a BS in chemistry from the U.S. Armed Forces Institute, University of Maryland in 1972. Um, those are our panelists today, um, and I'm thrilled to get us started um, with our first question. Um, what makes each of your school community, schools or communities unique? So 
for our two folks on the end who are both from <laughs> Quincy, what makes the Quincy community, Rosenwald community unique, and for Mr. Taylor, what makes the community at uh, Mount Nebo in Monroe unique? And anybody can start. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, unique is means um, you haven't had it before. Mm -hmm. So as you said in my bio, I at age six, I started um, school in 1944. Um, it was a little wooden school. Uh, all of this history is housed at um, this University in Nash Nashville, Tennessee. So they sent me a picture of what the school looked like in 1944, about a week a week ago. But at age six, um, what you didn't have, the uh, community is a population, much less then now, it's 3,000 with three red lights. So at age six, we didn't, it's unique because it's something uh, we didn't have. It was a new experience for me when my parents brought me to first grade that I was going to a building called a school. And as a child, I may have heard them not understanding too well that uh, the church was the school for everybody else. Uh, and before that, they didn't have a school at all. But when the community got a church, then the children were taught there. And at age six, the Rosewall School had been built uh, since 1920. I started in 1944, but it was new to me. So that, that was very unique uh, to me, a very new experience. Okay. Uh, it's interesting to me that uh, I didn't begin my education in De Quincey. I started in a uh, Louisiana Creole community called Swallow, which was in the central part of the state. And uh, I, I don't think I could speak a word of English until I was five years old. So my grandmother told my mother, you know, that I didn't have a need for education. Why was I gonna leave there? Long story short, my family moved out of that little farming community yeah. where there was only like about three grades available to us, first, second, third grade. At the end of third, well, about mid in March of my third year in elementary school, my family moved to De Quincey. All right. I moved into an entirely new culture, one that was entirely different from what I was accustomed to. Uh, and that taught me a very valuable lesson in school. If you, any of you have ever had the experience of moving into an area where you were unknown, uh, speak a different language, this, that, and the other, you'll find some difficulties there. But what I learned from that experience was that I had to continue. I knew that I couldn't stay at that level, so I had to, had to compete. Most of the time, all of the years that I was at Grand Avenue High School, competition was key to me, key for me. And that's what enabled me to continue. Of course, like I just didn't believe I could fail. If I did, that was the end of me. So uh, failure is not an excuse, I guess is what I'm saying. And that's one of the things that I gathered from Grand Avenue High School. Thank you. I came from Mount Nebo Elementary School. I grew up one block from the school. I did not go to the school at all. There were different other places for us to go to school at. We were urban. We were not rural. So we had three or four different places that we would get an education from. My school was built in 1920. That was 10 years after the community started. My community started in 1910. We had, at that time, when, we, when they built the school, there was 120 kids went to the school the first year because our, our neighborhood was, was small but large at the same time. And we had a, had a chance to um, migrate with people and do things with the folks. 
my neighborhood was a revolving place. People came there to make a living and start a business, start a family. Everybody would move there from somewhere else, another small town, another rural area, and that made up the the uh, the the, the, uh, the uh, neighborhood. We all came through different places and different times. I am very fortunate that my community was a neighborhood that was built with educators, that was built with people who were from the church that brought their money together and just put their uh, material together and labor together to build a school. Our school was there for people, for kids, and it was the best place to come to. That was the place that we all went to play at. That was the community place. We had no other place to play or meet. Those were the things that would matter to my, myself and others in my neighborhood because our neighborhood was a very strong neighborhood that grew up together, that did things together. We made people understand how things were built, what we had to come through to, to strive. There was, there, was nothing, there was nothing better for us than the hard times that we had. We had to, to, to you to learn how to work together. And that's what I, I will learn in the years that I grew up there. I've been in that neighborhood now for 100, uh, 20, <laughs> 20 years. This is a great neighborhood. It's done a lot for the people. And what we're trying to do now is to bring the, the neighborhood back together and show where we came from, how we came together and built things. We was not a neighborhood that had not had nothing because everybody was new, new in the neighborhood. So we all had to learn to get, come together. Mount Nebo Church is the first church that we knew that was school. And that grew out of us doing other things. We learned how to have things, learn how to come together, meet together, and work together because of the, the church and people in that neighborhood, my, my, our fathers and mothers, and sometimes our grandmothers and grandfathers were the, the catalyst to bring us where we are and where we are today. Thank you so much for sharing why your communities are unique. Um, one of the things we were talking about earlier before we went online, um, is that this is an undertold story. So I'm curious, the story of the Rosenwald schools is an undertold story. Um, so I'm curious, when um, you were growing up or when you were going to school, were you familiar with the Rosenwald School Project? Were you aware that the school in your community was connected? And um, if not, when did you learn about this larger project? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when, when we matriculated through Grand Avenue High School, that was never, there were never any historical facts mentioned to us about the Rosenwald school system or Rosenwald funding. That was not a part of our history. Uh, I don't know why that was like that. Even the names were changed. So the point I wanted to make was we didn't, uh, As I said, I started um, at age six uh, school in 1944. And I don't know if y'all can see this, but this was like um, kind of before you had a church or when you first got a church in the community. Uh, De Quincey was a, first a village around 1913, then a town after that. Then the people began to leave the farm areas and come to the community. De Quincey was a railroad town, Newport plant, pine trees, stumps. And uh, my just about everybody, my father, 
my husband, when I married, we all worked for the railroad. That that was a, a better living. But now the uh, church, it first got the community for us. As uh, Black folk, we got the church that was ours and a pastor. We felt like that that was ours. That you, you met everybody. You even met your husband, your wife at the church. You stayed all day Sunday at the church. Everybody, any problem, you listened to the pastor. Now, you didn't call the police. You called the pastor. So the church was very important to us. Then, as I said, after that, um, we got the school. And um, when I started school, my father would say, uh, if I could read and write, I could get a better, I could get a job, a better job on the railroad, like brakeman or fireman, but I can't read and write. So my teachers, my first teacher told not only me, but the other children, when you learn your alphabets and your numbers, most of your parents can't read or write. So what you learn in school, you go home and teach it to your parents. So uh, the dinner table became a classroom. And uh, my father made me feel like I was a teacher. The number is uh, 70312. That's in my head. I didn't know why for years, but that's his social security number. And then uh, I would walk uh, to the shop, the railroad shop with him to uh, punch in uh, the time clock. You know, and he might say, yes, ma'am. Uh, just like he would answer the teacher, made me feel very Im important. Um, so the, and my first grade teacher was uh, the, my music teacher. So I began to play for the church. Um, the name Rosenwald, uh, they didn't talk about it. And in uh, the later years, this is uh, when you asked when I first became aware. In 1966, an assignment was given at McNeese University in Sociology 231 uh, to write a paper on your community. This is a master's thesis on to a doctor's thesis. And uh, my mother said, told me, she said, there's no information about us in a book. So you better interview the older people who are still living, uh, like uh, Miss, uh, I don't know if y'all can see this, Miss Annie is about 10 years old. The baby is Miss Shot. Miss Claylee is 12 years old. It was really the historian. So before these people die, you have to talk to them and interview them and uh, find out. Uh, what happened, uh, how the community grew, how it was settled. All the information is here. And what has happened to a lot of communities, that uh, your history is in the graveyard because you didn't interview, you didn't talk to the people. So this is where my information came from. Uh, I got pictures, uh, you know, Mr. Robinson, he could read and write before there was a school. So he taught his children at home because he could read some and he could write some. But this thesis came from an assignment. Um, I understand that Julius Rosenwald was a man of character. He was a Christian man uh, with a good heart. He had a desire to help people, the greatest philanthropists in America. Um, they didn't put a name on the school. Uh, I don't know if y'all can see this either, but uh, we have a celebration every, biannually every two years. These are the Rosenwald schools, the little white wooden buildings with a lot of windows. And when we got the new school, they moved the Rosenwald schools behind the new school. No name when I started school was mentioned. He'd say, I'll give the money, but uh, whether you put my name on it or not, I'm not concerned about that. So as uh, 
Donald Ray said, and when we started school, we didn't hear the name Rosenwald. I, I don't think we saw a picture of him. Uh, most schools have a name across the front, but we, we weren't taught that and nothing was mentioned about uh, that. But as I worked uh, on my master's degree and my doctor's degree, um, that's in later years, not too, too long ago, I found out that these schools purposely were built modestly not to attract attention because of racial violence. They, they, you know, if it was something too nice, they would find a way to burn it down or destroy it. So uh, the wisdom of uh, Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald say, make it efficient with a lot of windows. Um, it was well, 1920, it was no electricity, uh, a well in the back and an outdoor accommodation, a toilet, I, those, but, but since you had nothing, that was very fine, but no name was on it, nothing to attract attention because of the racial violence that might occur. So the build, the schools were efficient, they served its purpose, but the, the idea was not to draw any attention to it. This is the school, the Nanebo Rosenwald School. It, it stood until 1972, and it was torn down. This was the place that we socialized. We did everything on, on, on the school campus. We played, we got education. All, everything that we owned was here. I got involved with this building years ago because we wanted to know where we were or who we were. We couldn't find out anything about the school. There was no, no, no knowledge. After we got in touch with Brian, he told us, about two years, three years ago, we found out that this was a, a Rosenwald school. Then we started researching and finding out more information. These schools was our way of getting an education. This, in 1920, they started building schools in 1912. They finished fifth building schools in 1948. That's when, all, that's when the schools were finally all was built. But this is where we, we came from. This is where we got our education from, our scientists, our lawyers, our doctors, all came from 1912. This was how this when we started getting our education. This is where we grew on to from that. We started out with 4,700 schools. Now, this is where we are because of the, these people. And I remember Booker T. Washington with him thinking like he was thinking, what well, is why we get, well, we got education because he came with the idea and Rosenwald came with the money. And those, those, those two things that work. Those are the kind of things that we have to learn to do again. If we start doing that, those are all the things that we can do for ourselves and for others. We got an example that work, that will work, and all that we have to try to do. It. This is kind of this is why I'm involved because of the fact I know where we came from, and I know how we can go further down the line for everybody. The only thing about it is now that our kids don't know. They don't have no understanding, no idea about Rosenwald or about Booker, or Booker T. Washington. These are the kind of things that we have got together. We started doing uh, the Mount Nebo Playground 34 years ago. We started having a, 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 a ceremony, celebration. That's what we started 30 years ago. It has not grown because we didn't add Rosenwald on, on it. We just started about, our, about the neighborhood and just dealing with people that we grew up with. We didn't understand that there were more people than the ones that's in our neighborhood than with the school there. Like I say, we started with 124 kids and that was 1920. 
So that's where we are going. And this is how we have to go. We have to start doing things together. People have to put money, material, labor together and minds together to make things work out for everybody. And for us, this is the best example of what we can do for ourselves. And if nobody, I'm glad that, 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 you, that you guys are having this uh, idea and, and giving the panel discussion, that gives us a chance to spread out the information among us. And I'm 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 missing I'm missing two people that I have known together for Rosenwald for, for life. And we always want to be to get together. But because of these things, we have learned some things about ourselves and some things at night, we have learned more about ourselves that we have not talked about. And we'll get a better understanding of what we can do and how we can do things. That's communication. We must learn how to communicate first. Then we have to learn how to work together secondly. Then we can do other things for everybody, anybody. But these are the kind of things we have to look at and do and look back at our, our background to, do, to know where we go into our future. That's the, those are the kind of things that we have to learn how to do and talk about. We have to talk about e economics, education, all those things tie in together. But unless we learn how to talk, tie them together, it's not going to work for anybody. I'm through. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Any responses before I move on to the next question? I would like to say it to piggyback of Mr. Frank. Um, one of the mottos of these men that we're talking about, great educator, great philanthropist, is um, just get it done. Let's let's work together and uh, get it done. Uh, we last March we were in Columbia, Texas, at a Rosenwald Museum where blacks and whites worked together to restore that. And one of the whites, as he talked, the tears was running down his face because he got some black. Uh, before about five years ago, we were in Tyler, Texas. Uh, where the, uh, the Rosenwald Museum, the building was restored and blacks and whites worked together to get that, that done. So uh, I'm enjoying um, this, just going through the building and going to other states across the South. And it's like, uh, just love if you can. And don't hate, you know, it takes energy to hate on people, you know, so just be positive. Let's work together and get it done. We're going, we're trying to hope that the Rosenwald family and the foundation will work together with us to get more of our towns that had Rosenwald School involved in. And then we, try, you know, we can do things that that would come together with us knowing how we have done things, where we come from. That's the most important thing I see that we can do. I think, you know, to piggyback off this conversation, this, this can be quite long, but there's there's one thing that I recall specifically about being a part of what we called back in those days a poor school, because we didn't have many resources. Uh, I think the school board probably provided nothing more than salaries and maybe keep the lights on, utilities. However, we needed money, okay? We needed money for all of our extracurricular activities, our athletic programs. We Even the school books that we shared, right, were not originally ours. When we would get them and open them up, we'd see the names from the kids uptown inside the books. But But my point is this, whenever we needed things, we had a way of generating money for Grand Avenue schools that had nothing to do with the Capital Parish School Board. We had a group of, of people that came together. If it, we needed money to travel, they raised the money. We sold things inside the school, popcorn balls, hot dogs, candies, whatever it takes. And that's how we generated most of our money. That's unbelievable to think today that you can operate a school just that way, 
because it requires so much more money today than we did back in those times. Point is that we stay together as a community. That's the way we operate, the community factor. So interesting. When I hear all you speaking, I've only recently gotten to learn about the Rosenwald history through our exhibit here at the museum. And so I've kind of gotten to learn a little bit about what brought Booker T. Washington and Julius Rosenwald together. Um, and it's this go, just get it done attitude. And then their goal was, we're going to build schools for the community. So it's so interesting to hear that, that legacy that, you know, here's funding for your school, build your school. The community is going to own that school. That is still so relevant even a hundred years later with just these two men who came together with a with a good idea. Um, and so it's just so powerful to get to hear it on the ground from your experiences. Um, which brings me to my next question. What do you see as the legacies of your schools, of your communities? What are those legacies you think of? Um, uh, as we say all the time, the legacy of our school is our people. Mm -hmm. Those people, be, number one, the facility is no longer there. They have, they have no more relics that we can cherish <laughs> from those times. But when I look back at the number of people that have succeeded from the organization that I grew up in, the high school that I did, many of them are professors, lawyers, doctors, teachers, whatever, you, any professional venture you can consider. We've developed that from the schools that I attended. And I don't think it was taught that way. It's just a, the attitude coming together as people to get things done. And that's, that's where we are. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I, I like the uh, saying, until we learn to read and write, someone else will tell your story. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to tell it very well. History is very important. If you know where you've been, you can better understand where you're going, what mistakes you made in the past. You can straighten that out in the, in the future. So until you learn, the little line learns to read and write. This would be encourage our children so much in, with the education. Somebody else is going to tell your story, and they're going to tell it their, their, their way. They will take credit for what you did and say they did it, inventions, what, whatever, and on and on and on. Um, in De Quincey, everything is torn down. Um, it's a few acres of land. It's about 10 acres. The gym is still standing there. Uh, it's storm damage. And uh, we are working to um, see the gym repaired. I have worked there before with uh, uh, troubled boys after school. They have classrooms in the gym. I did that for a while that uh, some needed extra help. Uh, they had activities at, at the gym. Now it's just sitting there. So uh, that's a goal to get that uh, repaired. And uh, an act, the Rosenwald Act has been passed to Congress in 2020. That money is available. Uh, you know, you state your cause and uh, apply for what you want to do with this on this land. We visualize a swimming pool, uh, baseball, field, basketball. Um, people come and ask for a building for activities and what have you. Uh, we have decorated the gym in years past and it was beautiful for what, whatever your, your, your occasion was, whatever it did. It was just decorated beautifully. We've had proms there and what have you. So um, this is what we have in view. This is our goal. Uh, we have the gym that's damaged and a lot of land with nothing on it. 5,000 schools, only only five of them are still standing because the rest have been torn down. Ours have been torn down. But we heard about the uh, what's available, the money, the Rosenwald Act. So just go up to another parish and share it with them. A uh, Beauregard Training School, which is Rosen, which is a Rosenwald school, is still there. So, uh, what do y'all want to do about it? 
and they quickly called a meeting. Uh, Virginia is interested in that. Mr. Brian Davis, mm -hmm. you know, has traveled to D uh, to Derrida to look at the building. So there, we are not there, but they are further up the road. The building is there. So you know, let's let's get it done. Let's get the money and uh, and uh, get it refurbished and restored. So in De Quincey, this is what we visualize uh, on that property. Uh, because if, if you let it, if you don't do anything, it's uh, on a highway, Highway 27, somebody is going to come and uh, find out, uh, have an idea of what to do with this land. So while we have a chance to hold on to it, um, work our vision and work our plan and uh, just work together to make it happen. I'm really hoping and and, and uh, looking forward to Dr. Cook, who, uh, Cook and I and others from the uh, sister state will come together to form an organization, something that will uh, work with Rosenwald Schools. And we then what, what we we're trying to do is get the younger teachers to talk about it in schools. That's how we can keep it alive. If the young teachers would talk, talk to our kids about these things, you can leave a legacy and a tradition that will be everlasting. But if we don't talk about those things, and it's not going to happen, this is what I have learned at the time I've been working with Rosenwald. The first thing every person asks me who is Rosenwald? Where is Rosenwald? You know, and I'm saying they built 4,700 schools, and we don't know nothing about it. And they were built it for our kids, they were our teachers, and this and this is the first thing that we have forgotten about. This is the first thing that we should all be talking about: how these men gave us a chance to give us what we need. That's a, a education. We've all talked about that. My parents, all the parents talked about, you need education, get education, read and write. Well, the biggest thing that we need to know how to do is roll the wall and book a tea. Because then we got an education, but we don't know anything about them. So the first thing that we have to learn how to do is trying our kids, all, all our people, young and old, about Rosenwald and Booker T. So we can start putting our future and our past back together the same, the right way. As long as we don't talk about it, there's nothing else we're ever going to be done about it. Communication is the first thing that we have to do and learn how to communicate. We may not, may not always want to talk to each other, but there are different things that we have to teach each other. It's better, it's more than anything else. It's about teaching us our past to get, a, get us a future. We can we don't know how to make economics. We don't do nothing, we don't know anything about economics. This is the first thing that we can do for ourselves that can build up. Our parents and our grandparents built schools with small bits of money to do these things. You now, why can't we do these things more and better now that since we have more monies and we're doing less with it? So these are the kind of things that we have to talk about and be honest about and tell the truth about it. Our problem is our problem because we are letting these things go to the wayside. Unless we are doing things to build it up, it's not. It's going to go away. Just like we're talking about, the schools are going away. Well, the knowledge is going to go away because as we get older, the, we our kids are not going to remember these things. So these are the kind of things that we have to lay out for ourselves to keep us going. If we're going to have a history, then we have to learn how to teach and talk about our history all of the time, not just when we feel that it's 
uh, better or worse for us. We have to learn to do this all of the time and make it better for everybody. I'm through with you. I appreciate it. Do you have that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, just expand on what he's saying. Whenever we have a, a reunion, we always print a little booklet with the history, and you have to tell the history over and over again and act it out. My daughter is with me today and the others from my church, my pastor is here. I'm sure they're gonna pick up on this, but uh, we, we always published this. We were together in May. We put something in their hand. You, your history is something you have to talk about it. You have to tell it over and over again. When uh, this costs us six hundred dollars, she get a full page in the, the newspaper. But uh, we do it, and uh, this gets the the histories out. Um, so the alumni, one or two of them, will always be the speaker for the occasion. But we always take a full page ad. It's not so much the newspaper now as it is. Facebook, but uh, <laughs> you have to, somebody told me I was wasting my money on that. <laughs> and uh, this book, I understand this book is in its third printing. As fast as it can be printed, people just don't know the history. Uh, they knew they know black folk were enslaved, they know about slavery, but how were black folk educated coming out of slavery? Uh, slavery, Egyptian slavery, uh, European, any of them you can compare that uh, it was pretty bad. But they came out of slavery, what I mentioned earlier, instead of hating on people, uh, let's get busy and get something done. Uh, the Blacks educated themselves in 30 years. They came out of slavery and they did it. So uh, I don't know where this is going to go. But anything that's printing this fast is a movie next. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure our, the photographer, Andrew Filer, would, and I don't know if a movie, but I think <laughs> further uh, distribution. It's a wonderful book. Um, we're thrilled to have the special exhibition. Um, and perhaps more folks need to keep going out to, to the schools as they exist today and keep photographing them, perhaps as those Rosenwald funds come in, we'll see them from this state where a lot of them are, are gone to what has been renewed and revitalized because of the work that y'all are doing. So my last question, um, and then we'll open it up to questions in person or online. Um, what is something like the Rosenwald School community that you saw from your youth, um, from your younger days? What's something you see like that in your community today? In my community, we are seeing and doing things that uh, that we started 30 years ago, that getting the ed um, information out is to get more of us to come back down there and to learn how that we can do be economically strong. We have to rebuild our neighborhoods. And one thing we have to do is learn how to make money in our neighborhood. I think one of the things that we're talking about trying to do this year at our family day of Rosenwald reunion day is that we were trying to start uh, bed and breakfasts. <clears throat> so one thing that we call we are from small places, people don't want to come home. So um, are we thinking about how did we travel years ago? Hmm. Everybody stayed in somebody's house. It slept on the floor, slept on the bed. <laughs> so these are the kind of things that we're trying to get started. They are bed and breakfast. People have, all of us now, most of us now, are living by ourselves because we're old. Kids are gone. So why not invite somebody to your house to a family day, to a reunion day, and have part of the, the thing? So what we do in our, in our community that we have a bed, uh, we have uh, uh, where we 
where we're going to get together and let people come in to eat and drink, not drink, but um, to socialize. Um, not a bed and breakfast. I can't get the name. Uh, um, yeah, what we trying to what we have to do with Family Day? Uh, I, I don't know what this I can't call it now. Yeah. What we did Friday last uh, last year. People came in and we talked. I can't think of the name. I apologize. No. <laughs> But all of us came together and we talked. We had a, 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 a dinner and we talked. Everybody took turns and talked about the history and that made it better. And then we had the people from New uh, Natchitoches came in and did the in interview. Now, what we have started is doing interviews with the older people. Uh, we had uh, Mrs. Green, which is 96 years old. She is the last person that worked at the, at the uh, school. So we interviewed her first. Now we are interviewing people who went there when it was a grade. So we all try and get folks involved and get their knowledge about the story, about the, the school and the neighborhood before they pass. Those are the kind of things that we're doing right now. And every time we have a reunion or uh, come together, we have people to, to talk. And we're going to share our information and then we're going to build it up that everybody would know what we're doing and how, and how we got together. We got uh, one year man that he showed up, Oscar, Oscar like 85, and he talks about the neighborhood and his, his best partner that's there with him. They talk about all the things they did, they did together at the school and in the neighborhood, and they were all good sports people too. So all that time, they they're, they're going back, remembering how they came up and, and smiling and having, having a good time. These people are actually having a good time and enjoying talking about their past mm -hmm. because they, they, we all old now and we don't get a chance to realize how what we did and how we did, did it because most of us are gone and we don't have get a chance all the time to, to re relate to people and to give everybody a chance to know what we've done years ago. Those are the kind of things that we're trying to bring back to our neighborhood because our kids, our young folks don't know. And, and, and if they get any pride or respect for the neighborhood where they grew up, and most of them are, wrong, are gone away, it's because we're telling them how well we came out up. Yeah, it was, it was a hard time, but my time was a pinnacle. My neighborhood was at the top. My neighborhood was come with had jobs, had a little money in, and you had educators. We had teachers, principal, all those things in my neighborhood. So my neighbor gave me a chance to see a better life and a better chance to get education from people who were edu being educated and were staying right next door to me or right down the street from me. And they shared their knowledge and what we had to do for our community to make a better community. They had they the ones that made have us with gloves and bats and balls and bats, all those kind of things. These people in the neighborhood got got those things for us, just like they built the school for us. We came into a position of life that people worked together and everybody in the neighborhood helped everybody out. You food, anything that the neighborhood would try to do for people. Mm -hmm. And that made me have a better look on my life and on my neighborhood because of how I, I came up. I came up trying to help. I came up, we had, everybody had a growth a uh, garden and, <laughs> and everybody shared food, you know? So those are the kind of things I came up with. And I'm, I'm glad for that. I was uh, listening to what you said about people coming together and staying together. <clears throat> there was something that we do, okay, those of us from Capuchin Parish, from the Quincy. I live in Baton Rouge now, okay? I lived in New Orleans for about 30 years before Katrina. But what I've recognized is that there are as many people, if not more, that are living in East Baton Rouge Parish than that live 
in De Quincey today when I was growing up there. Most of those people have had careers, you know, either in the universities or their careers here in East Baton Rouge. So we keep our people together that way. Uh, there are these annual, biannual reunions that have been something of the past within Grand Avenue, but the classes have diminished, okay? So our attempt is to keep the people together just because the graduates are no, no longer here, we've run out of classes. We can still remain as a, together by keeping our people together wherever we are. And we're fortunate to have over 100 people here in East Baton Rouge Parish. And we, oh, one other thing, twice a year we get together. There'll be another gathering next, the weekend after Easter. Then we do another one in the fall, right after Labor Day. But those are just events that we come together for. I want to say that these are examples of Rosenwald. I didn't go to Rosenwald, but these are people who went to Rosenwald and what became successful and anything that they did because of the education that they received years ago. This is this is what was it's all about. This is this is an example of people that started with nothing and came through and, and did something with, with life, with careers, with knowledge and wisdom and trying to give it back. This is what it's all about. These people here are all great people in my eyesight because this is the beginning of our education. These people are the beginning. 1912, they was just starting to uh, educate us. Now, these are some of the same, uh, first people who come up out of, out of that education system that shows that it will work, and it does work. And then they can show you how it works and what we can do to make it work better and longer for us. And that's what our kids, young folks, need this education. They need to know what went on before them and always try to say how bad it is, but they don't know what bad is. Now, people from Rosenwald and all of us, we can give them true knowledge about it because they were there in it. These are the kind of things that we have to give our kids. I, I was yeah. about to say, we haven't really touched on it. I don't know if we're skating around it, but um, our, our system is violent. Mm -hmm. We have too much violence. My pastor is sitting in the back. I don't know if she cared to comment on that, but she did something about it. Um, when I started school with one teacher handling everybody and getting the most respect, walking all across the campus, and you didn't move. <laughs> she was out, out the room. You just utter respect and control. We don't we don't have that today. We have we have a lot of violence. Um we uh teachers are uh using most of the time disciplining and very little time teaching. We are. So thank God for the schools where teaching is going on and it's probably going to be in a, a private school. Shame to say, but I kind of told them, don't call me for public school <laughs> when I retire. <laughs> say, don't, don't call me for that. Uh, but my pastor is sitting in the back and she had a vision and she, she addressed that. That that violent situation, I can't do. We can't do anything with this child. We just can't teach him. Can't teach him. We have one. Oh, we have one question from the chat, and maybe we'll go a little over. Um, it was aimed for Dr. Cook, so I'll ask you to go first, and then I'll open it up to the other two folks on our panel. Panel. African American valued education during those times in the past. What is needed to recreate that same value in education today? And that's from uh, Charlotte Wilson in Beaumont, Texas. <laughs> we know. Well, there, there, there's one one thing that affects us all. Okay, mm -hmm. and that education is still operated by the governments, right? I mean, in terms of I'm talking public education, 
the funding for that, the operation of those systems. That's all about that. Uh, we have to we have to find a way to make that work for us. Okay, we we can't just allow things to happen. Okay, we have to control it through the ballot box. Mm. I, I think that teachers have to take more control over their situations in those classrooms when if they can and when they can because there is some so much lost when our kids are not educated to know things. When you don't when a kid don't know Rosenwald School and this teacher is black and they can't tell you nothing about the school or nothing about the education that we came through due to get to where we are, that's a big problem. Um, until we learn how to give information, take pride and respect in what we have and what we do, there's no, nothing going to be done. Our problem is that we don't care for things. We don't have the value of others about things, uh, pictures, papers, everything that we don't have any, any care about, about. When you look at our neighborhoods, you can see how much we don't care about our, ourselves because our neighborhoods are trash. That's all that go together with that. We're not teaching ourselves to have value, to have a, 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 a property that was clean, that would know something about Rosenwald, that would know something about all, all our educated, educated people, that some of the places have schools named after them. We don't know them. Even our teachers who are teaching those schools in those schools can't give you information. That's one of our biggest problems. We have stopped giving and taking education to to heart. When I came through, the teachers, whatever school I went to, gave information to you. They gave you knowledge that you didn't that didn't get out of a book. That would tell you that you had to, you got to work harder than the other side. Those are those were teachers that we still remember today. We don't remember these kids that's coming out today that don't that can't put together things that can make you want to learn or that's going to teach you something that you need to know out of life. The teachers that I grew up with and uh, you guys grew up with, they gave us a purpose in life. They gave us and told us how hard it was for us to, to get anything. And they told us that we had to work extra hard. That made a difference. When you know these things, you are going to handle them differently. We have made it too young, too soft on our kids and our young people. They don't understand how it is that you need to uh, do something. You need to uh, go for a walk or something else. We don't have any sure, any, any real things that we have teaching our kids to do or to say, we just let them go. And that's, that's our biggest problem. Our problem is that we are taken away from our kids to learn or to have a hard time doing things. Everything is not, should come to you easy. The more you have to work your brain and work for, for patience, that's the best, the best way that you have to go. We came up that you you didn't have any choice, but it was hard. And now that all that stuff was hard, we learned from it. It didn't it didn't make us solve. It didn't it, even we got mad. We learned how to work through get getting mad to get what we needed. Those are the kind of things we don't have patience. We don't have things that would bring us work together to do things. We don't have commitments. We don't have priorities. 
those are things that we are missing. My kids are missing today. That there there is no commitment for anything. And as long as that's going to happen, we're not going to get any further in life. And those are the problems that we're having in our neighborhoods. There's no pride. There's nobody. Uh, uh, the people in the neighborhood don't paint houses or, or do lawn work. And if, you know, people would not, kids would not tear up and, and, and do graffiti on stuff if their dad and mom had to be the one that would paint it. No, I don't do that because my dad did that work. We get pride in things that we were doing. Those are some of our better, biggest problems. Thank you. And Dr. Cooks, do you have any last words about how we value? The question was, um, you know, we used to, an undervaluement of education. How do we get that value back in? Well, I, I, I mentioned my pastor. She's you probably can say it better than I can, but uh, she checked the children in the church, mm -hmm. and uh, they weren't the, the results weren't what uh, we thought they should be. So she started homeschool using the ACE curriculum, and uh, just changed the classroom. Students, you sit at a desk, you carry a briefcase, and you dress a certain way. You work at a scoring station. Even when I was at the gym, I was told, look, <laughs> these are some bad boys. Uh, they, they've been in class all day, so whatever you do in the evening with them at the gym, it can't be the same thing. It's, it's gonna, you, you're going to have to teach math and science a different way. So uh, I'm a firm believer uh, when you uh, approach the subject, whatever you're teaching, and you get the interest of the student, you get them really involved, then that that's all, all these discipline problems that that's going when they're interested in what they what they're doing, uh, you you will have a better classroom where teaching and learning is really going on. Mm -hmm. I think we could keep this conversation going and for the folks who are here in person, we we can. Um, but for, um, for our folks online, um, I know we have some more questions and I'm, um, sorry, but we'll, uh, have to maybe do a part two to this panel, um, as we think, as we continue through what is Rosenwald's legacy, what are the Rosenwald school legacies? And, um, as you guys continue doing the work of connecting communities, um, and thinking about the future. Um, so I want to thank you all so much for sharing your time and your expertise with us here today. Um, it's incredibly uh, meaningful for me to get to welcome you to the museum uh, and to activate the, the exhibition we have upstairs and think ahead to the future past our special exhibition and what the museum is going to uh, help continue the Rosenwald story in the future. Um, really quickly, I just want to let everybody know that we still have about a month of Rosenwald related um, uh, events. So a week from today in person, um, we have our final screen screening of the Rosenwald film by Aviva Kepner. Um, and you can find more information for that online. Um, and then we have our closing field trip. We are gonna leave the museum on April 21st, the day the special exhibition closes. And we're gonna take our a trip to Donaldsonville, Louisiana to visit the River Road African-American Museum's preserved Rosenwald School. They've done a renovation of their Rosenwald School um, and we're gonna have three historians speaking in that Rosenwald School as while our special exhibition is closed upstairs, we're still thinking ahead to the future of the work that this Rosenwald School story, story requires. Keep up to date with the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience by signing up for our newsletter and following us on all the social media platforms. And then a recording of today's presentation will be available on our YouTube channel in the coming days. So thank you all so much for joining us here today. I very much appreciate thank it. You, thank you. Thank you.